Yes. What is it like to be a bee? <laughs> I, I don't know. I can tell you that right away. Um, yeah, so um, I'm interested in um, human reasoning. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> human reasoning and in artificial general intelligence. In artificial general intelligence, that's uh, uh, artificial intelligence programs that can do more than one thing, basically. That's a working definition. And, um, um, yeah, so I recently came back from an AGI conference in China, and uh, the state of the art isn't very impressive, I must say, because uh, the, the best thing that I heard of was a program that could play a primitive work version of poker and also Pac-Man and also Tic-Tac-Toe. So it could pick up those, the rules of those games by learning, by playing, and uh, no uh, manual programming work was, was required. But to, to um, uh, realize the idea of AGI, you have to find uh, basic mechanisms for reasoning and concept formation. And um, I think that, yeah, it's, it's very common to seek inspiration in, in the human uh, neural system because we, are, we have general intelligence, so we can do uh, a lot of things. But um, I think it's interesting also to look at bees assuming that uh, also more primitive animals have basically the same principles, then it will be easier for us to, to find those principles. At least we can start with those principles that we have in common. And I think that bees are fascinating in themselves too. Yeah, so I think that bees outperform artificial systems both in versatility, they can do more things, and they're also much more robust. So it's much more impressive to be able to find honey and fetch honey in natural environments that change all the time than to be able to play Pac-Man, for example, which is a completely static game. That's a... yeah. Right. Okay, so, yeah, the bees world looks something like this, maybe. They have to keep track of uh, geography, topography, different flowers that they can um, feed on and um, where their hive is located, where the flowers grow, which flowers uh, carry nectar, what parts of the year, etc. And when I talk about bees here, I actually refer to a specific bee. There are many bees, and yeah, I'm talking about this one, the ordinary one, honeybee. This is the honey-carrying bee. Okay, and a lot of a lot is known about bee cognition. So um, and also about bee brain because they do have brains, and uh, the brain contains about a million neurons. And as you can see, they have a bilateral symmetry, just like humans and um, birds, reptiles, and so on. And that enables them to use very basic principles of locomotion and navigation. Um, that we can uh, mimic in uh, Breitenberg vehicles, for example. Very simple mechanisms that make the agents look intelligent, even though they function in a, in a very simplified way. It's a four-neuron could be a four neuron creature which looks intelligent. Breitenberg vehicle, basically. Okay, but bees are much more than that. They're not only hardwired, instead, they are uh, dynamic. Uh, display. They have neuroplasticity and the ability to form memories. Uh, for example, they can, they can learn things by associative learning. So part of it is hardwired, born that way, and part of it is learned. Okay, 
And one thing that was demonstrated early on is the ability to learn visual and olfactory patterns of flowers. So they can select the right kind of flower, find the flower, and uh, find the right kind of flower. And I'm going to um, mention a few uh, experiments on these, showing that uh, what kind of cognitive capacities they have. Memory formation, again. Um, it was recently discovered, this year actually, that bees can also differentiate uh, uh, patterns in electrical charges. Because flowers, there, there's, the, the atmosphere is charged with, with um, particles and they, and then the plants for example, they use like, they, 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 they act like lightning rods, you know, so they lead down the electricity. And that creates electrical fields around the flowers, and it turns out that bees are actually sensitive to electrical fields. And each flower has, the, has its own uh, signature, electric signature, and bees are sensitive to that too. So they can, they can, they can do things that we can't do. And they can also, so they can learn a lot of things about nature and their natural habitat, but they can also learn more artificial things, like human letters, for example. Um, and they can learn that independently of size, color, position, etc. So they, they just learn to recognize the shape, kind of miraculously, just like a child can do that. We think that's a yeah, that's a, that's a miracle, but it's also even more a miracle that a bee can do can do the same. So this also illustrates the robustness. So it's independently of the size and color and position and so on. And yeah. Here is, um, this experiment indicates that bees can actually, actually have a notion of symmetric versus asymmetric. So one group of bees in this experiment was taught that symmetrical targets offer food, while asymmetrical ones didn't. And then another one, another group was taught the opposite les lesson. So, and then it took them about uh, seven times to see through this pattern, to form this pattern, to understand how it works. And um, from then on, they picked the correct uh, stimulus over the other one. So they learned to differentiate, differentiate between symmetric and asymmetric pictures. Well, that's also pretty abstract, I think. Yeah, and... Um, Here's another one. They learn the location of foods uh, by using landmarks, like, I don't know, trees, mountains, so on. Um, yeah, so it seems that they memorize the view of locations. That's how they can find their way back to the same place again. And um, here's an interesting experiment, I think. So they use a bowl of sugar water, bees like, and they move it around, around, around the hive, far away from the hive, like kilometers from, away from the hive. And then bee societies have scout bees, whose job is to uh, locate food and go back home and tell the others about it. You know this bee dance, which indicates the polar coordinates, showing a the, the distance and um, the angle, the direction to the food. But to have something to report, they need to have scout bees. And uh, they moved around this bowl of sugar water, um, and it worked very well. The bees located the scouts, located it, and then came back and told the other bees about it. Who flew flew that way immediately? They flew direct, directly to that. So the communication works really well. But then one day. Uh, a mean scientist, Gold, uh, placed this sugar bowl on, on a boat in the, in the middle of a lake. And that's kind of unusual. And then it turned out that um, the scouts returned as usual to communicate this to their, to their um, uh, fellow bees. And uh, then this time the bees refused to go with them. They didn't leave the hive because they thought that was, that's too weird. So it indicates that they know that, um, yeah, right there is a lake. 
and in lakes there are no uh, there's no there, there are no flowers there's no honey it's impossible no sorry no yeah no no sugar water in this case um, so I I don't know how to explain this but it's I think it's quite uh, intriguing. Oh, bees are capable of memory formation, yeah. And um, also, they take reward into account. So reward learning is even a robust phenomenon in bees. So reward is really important for their learning. And that's why I'm, I am particularly interested in, in bees. Yeah, reward is, is a very general mechanism that has been demonstrated, reward learning, that has been demonstrated across many taxa in the animal kingdom. It's a, one of the truly basic mechanisms. So it's called, in the context of psychology, it's often called operant conditioning. So you, have, you can reinforce some behaviors if you get more reward that way, and you can also decrease some behaviors if you get punishments. <clears throat> okay, so what is it that we learn? Well, one thing is actions. We learn how to behave. We learn how to act in an environment. But I think that that's just one part of it. We also learn, for example, what our environment looks like. It doesn't have to do with actions. We learn that uh, there's a, a lawn out here, there's a, this is a bull um, ground, etc. Um, and um, yeah, so not only actions. And also, um, yeah, what factors influence learning, would you say? One, one is repetition. It's, it's, well known, uh, that, that repetition is really a crucial thing in, for learning. And another one is affection or emotions, as we say, if we, if we talk about you know, <coughs> So if we get reward for something, we are more likely to, to remember it. And if we get punished, we are also likely to remember that. So we remember things in our lives that have been repeated often. And we also remember things that have strong emotional connotations. <coughs> Maybe, um, yeah. I just want to add something. Yeah. Uh, there is a guy in Gothenburg, Ferenc Smartom. When he looks at a list like this, he says, you've forgotten one important thing. Yeah. That is variation. So he wants repetition connected with variation. So you have repetition, mm. but small variations. Yeah. And then you can form a stable. Uh, well, some kind of abstraction from the particular things. Yeah. Or another way of arriving at the same conclusion <laughs> would be to say that variation. We, we are curious, so we get we get rewarded by variation, and in that way we will get. We are still in the affected case. But, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, this seems to be also something which is very general among animals in, animals in general, and also uh, humans in particular. And if you look at uh, reinforcement learning, which is a method, a common method in artificial intelligence, then it only uh, focuses on, on actions, learning actions associated to reward. But I would like to go on and generalize that a little bit. Okay, so here's, here's an example. If we imagine that we're riding a train, a kind of boring train ride usually, we look around and we will, we will see the interior of the train many times. So we'll kind of learn what it looks like because of the, by virtue of repetition. And, um, but in general, we will not remember all the, the scenes that we see when the train passes by on high speed especially. Because that isn't repeated, right? Some parts may be repeated if we travel with the Siberian Trans-Siberian Railroad, for example, we see a lot of planes, maybe, so we remember planes. But we can also remember some things from a train ride. If we see something that uh, makes an emotional impression on us, oh, that's a really ugly factory. 
kind of whoa, you, you may remember it. Or that's a really beautiful horse standing there. I, I remember that also from the train ride. And um, if we look at an example with a maze, which is often used in operant conditioning studies, um, you have a maze, a rat walks around in the maze, tries to find its way to a cheese to reward. And um, learning speed goes up. It's known that the rat learns in kind of reverse order. So first it just errs around, and uh, then when it actually finds the cheese, it will that will enhance learning of what the environment looks like. So it will remember where it found the cheese, and then the next time when it walks in the maze, it will remember the room right before it comes to the room with the cheese, and so on. And in that way, the reinforcement, the reward will be spread at, uh, throughout the maze, from the, from the goal to the start. Yeah. So, um, that's, yeah, that's the idea of, of um, uh, reinforcement learning, and that can also be applied in the case of learning what the maze looks like. If we imagine a maze with some, uh, like, like a real maze, like a forest, for example, there are things to remember. When we, when we make those rats experiments, the maze usually looks the same everywhere. <clears throat> yeah, so I think that um, yeah, reward has been used a lot for learning actions in the context of reinforcement learning. But I think that um, it should also be used for learning other concepts than actions. For example, different features of the environment. And, um, yeah, it seems very likely to me that learning actions and learning features of the environment, they are processes that are completely intertwined as all learning in, in uh, natural neural systems. So I seem to think that that, could be tri that should be tried also in artificial systems. So that's, that's my motivation. So now I'm going to present the computational model. This is like the background, and now I'm going to present... What is social in this? Yeah, it's the, the social uh, dimension here is that um, reward in, in, in social animals, not only in social animals, but in particular in social animals, like bees, humans, um, a very significant part of the reward comes from um, the surrounding world, this, the, from, from, from other individuals of the group. So other individuals of the group will influence behavior. And in this case, it will go further than that. It will even influence the shape of the brain. So others will influence the shape of the brain with, with this kind of view. Okay, so now I'll present, I'm going to present this, this kind of mathematical model. Some of you may not uh, find that interesting in all details, but yeah, I'm going to try to give, give a, a rough picture of what it looks like. <clears throat> because in order to, to carry out this project, to go from, uh, yeah, to create an artificial system, you have to have a concrete model of some kind. And I try to keep that model as simple as possible. So in this, this model is inspired by dual process theory. There are several versions of dual process theory, uh, including the one by Kahneman for fast and slow thinking. We make a slightly different, or we make a different distinction, namely one between perception and imagination. So we think it's important to keep those apart, perception and imagination. Reality and imagination, are those are they worth uh, separating, or is it is that useless? Well, the way we see it is that perception is used for sensing the environment, and imagination for speculating about the environment. Two completely different things. And imagination is something which is fundamental in decision making. I think we heard that yeah, yesterday also. That it's, it's uh, what is it? Gamma waves. I think no. The motor waves um, that, he, that Anton talked about. The same kind of waves are active when we move our foot and when we think about moving our foot. Imagine that we're moving our foot. Right? 
Um, okay, but imagination is very important in thinking in general. So it enables us to think hypothetically. What if something happened? Enables us to think to do case-based thinking. Either it's this way or that way. Suppose it's this way. And then suppose it's that way. Again, let's go. And also counterfactual reasoning. What if something were true? And that's the driver of uh, creativity too. You have to invent something that doesn't exist already. And you have to have some kind of imagination to do that. And if you try to use the ordinary system for... Uh, uh, if you try to use the perceptive system for imagination, as some people suggest, then I think it's um, you're in a, on, on dangerous ground in many cases. Because yeah, if you don't distinguish between perception and imagination, it's actually a, a psychiatric condition if you, we talk about humans. Yes? Uh, of course, an alternate way of characterizing that is you can say, well, all of us have our personal understanding of reality, yes. but most of us are able to distinguish what is our personal uh, understanding of reality from what is shared reality, and we don't assume that other people share our personal no, that's right. reality. Yeah. And when we assume that other people do, then it's psychiatric. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think that, um, yeah, you have, th th there is some kind of um, so we think personal true. perception of, uh, of reality, and uh, then there is a common, commonly accepted, like the intersection of what people think, that's, that's kind of common, commonly accepted knowledge. But in addition to that, there is this, Im these imagined worlds, when we speculate about what could it be like this, could it be like that, when we build up our own personal views of the world. In uh, Lund and in Krubb, the, there are brain researchers who hold the view that uh, speculation is just perception running you know, on its own. Um, do you think that's a mistaken view? I mean, there's this Finnish guy in Krubb, I forget his name. Oh, um, huh? Ante and Ante Remso. Yeah, he Ante. thinks that perception is like a wake dream. Yes. It makes no strong distinction. No, exactly. Between exactly. And, um, and perception. You think this is a big, he is on the wrong track? I, I think it's, um, I mean, it may work that way neurophysiologically, but conceptually, when we try to build models of these things, I think it's very, it's a great advantage to be able to, to separate the two. So I can answer like that. I don't have much of an opinion when it comes to how it actually works in real. Well, that, that's precisely it. It's a, a, an important, maybe essential, conceptual distinction, but we shouldn't confuse that with the prior ontological one. I think you'd agree from what yeah. you just said. Yeah, correct. So what does that mean? That we think that they are on the wrong track? I think they're on the wrong track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's interesting because, I mean, if you don't separate reality and imagination, then you have delusions, right? You can't separate what is my my speculation and what is reality. I don't know, that's delusion. Yeah. I, I just uh, feel that, like, for example, if people without hands or leg, you know, like... Sorry, if people... Without leg or hands, you yes. know, they still feel that they're moving. Yeah, phantom... What is it like? It's uh, absolutely like, interesting for me. Like, yeah. It's... Sure, I mean, but, but, but that fits into this uh, model, I think. It's, it's fairly natural. You can imagine things, uh, even though you don't have the ability to carry out the motor actions, for example. How long this memory is working? I mean, is it kind of, you know, there is kind of time and... I think it depends uh, when you get your injury. So I think it can last very long if you... Yeah. Um, in, so with random limbs, so they also get direct uh, sensory input from the nerves, which are close to uh, That was one of the explanation of this film. It's not that they imagine so much, but they have... Uh, stimul there is stimuli just from the air, or, or where is the cut the link, so uh -huh. okay. um, it projects to the place where it was the actual uh, end of the nerve, so it could be uh, like direct perception. Okay. I think that those experiments, and I don't know, I'm not really into the thing, but where they were putting people into some kind of salt solution and totally closing any type of sensory input, that people developed hallucinations or something. I have done it. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. It's, no, you don't. 
you just float around for a while and feel relaxed. No, no, some people. <laughs> <laughs> if, if the sensory deprivation is complete enough, you can have extremely intense, um, well, perceptual experiences, although they decay with time. But you didn't. No, I mean, what you do is you sort of forget things and you feel very comfortable and you float around. And, and you, I mean, I made conscious efforts also to think about almost nothing, but. It, the experience lasts for about an hour or so. It's worth trying, but it's not not no, worth no. shaking. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know, I've like heard that, that people get hallucinations or bizarre. Uh, and that can be, yeah, extremely graphic, but I think it decays with time, so they're uh, initially extreme. Well, maybe if you're in there for six hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what, one, one example of, um, of delusions would be uh, uh, well, I don't know, superstition, for example. Maybe that's uh, yeah, mixing up uh, causalities a little bit. But I think, like superstition, uh, an extremely superstitious person would have a handicap in uh, in the real world because you, it would, he or she would attribute uh, things that happen to the wrong causes, for example. And if you think that it's uh, warm when it's cold, and if you have no uh, no connection to reality. If you're completely detached, then you're you don't function very well. So I think it is a, a cognitive handicap if uh, you're you're an agent dealing with reality, living in reality, uh, and you are unable to distinguish between imagination and perception. So that's why I think that um, also artificial agents should have this should make this distinction. Okay, now the model. So this our model here is a, is a network model. It's a graph. A graph. It's just uh, some nodes that are model neurons, very roughly, and some some connections. And the connections model the, the synapses. But we have two kinds of, of um, connections. One for P perception, and the other for I as in imagination. So we have both imagination and perception activity floating around in this network, in this graph. So mathematically speaking, it's a very simple thing. And then some basic kinds of computation are done at the nodes. Because we want, we, we, we want to feed the network with perception, with stimuli from the ex exterior, external world. And then we want that to create a flow of um, activity in the network, so that the networks can be used for computational purposes. And the labels on the nodes of this network are these, sensor, motor, minimax, delay, and space. And I'm going to go through examples explaining what kind of computations are being made at each type of node. Yeah, and then we also want to do th things similar to Bayesian reasoning in this network, so probabilistic reasoning. Because that's what we can do also, like humans can do probabilistic reasoning. It's, uh, yeah. I believe that it's like uh, 0.5 chance that it's gonna rain today, for example. Can say something like that. And that can help me. 0.4. 0.4. That, that can help me in, in, the, in my decision making. It can even be, uh, it can be crucial to, to, uh, to survival even, to, to, to be able to make those, those uh, um, probabilistic um, draw the probabilistic conclusions reasonably well. So we have um, um, numbers associating the probability that a node will be active and also nodes uh, on, on the edges, on the imaginary, imagination edges, we also have uh, numbers for conditional probabilities. Given that this node is active, the probability, what is the probability that this node will also be active? Okay, so here's a very simple example of a network. Uh, it's a, this is a min gate, and here we have two other gates, uh, coffee and sugar they are called, but they represent sensory information that gets active when coffee, when we have coffee, we taste coffee, and when we taste sugar, respectively. So, yeah. And we use uh, the black edges here for perception and the blue ones for imagination. And here we have this 
point seven here, for example, it indicates that given that uh, uh, I I sense coffee, I drink coffee, for example, the probability that I'll think about sugar, associated to sugar, is point seven in this case. Yeah, this could be. This is, of course, like a, this has to do with habits, experience. So also culture. So in, in, in some places or some subcultures where you always have coffee with sugar, that number may be higher, for example. So it all has to do with experience. The probabilities that we assign to any kind of event is only based on our personal experiences. Okay, and the stimuli come as um, uh, values to the sensors, real values. In zero one, and then these this stimuli generates two types of activity: perception and imagination. In principle, perception activity travels on the perception edges, perception connections, and the imagination activity travels on the imagination edges. So we have functions that assign to each uh, node neuron and at each time uh, a certain level of activity. So here's what happens for example when we when we have coffee with sugar we use red for perception. So then this is active and this is also active. And then this one will be active. Same thing. It's a min, right? So if th these are one, both of these are one, this one will also be one. So now we can, this one detects both coffee and sugar. That's the notion of both sugar and coffee. But if we, if we only get coffee instead, we don't get sugar, then we start thinking about uh, sugar. We imagine that we have sugar also. We imagine sugar with a certain probability, oh, yeah, with a certain intensity. In this case, it would be also the 0 0.7. The imaginary activity here would be 0.7. Okay, and using these very simple building blocks, we can build a lot of things. We can build networks, and those networks can also start evolving. That's the, that's the fun part. So we, we can um, um, model natural organisms in this way. Very rough models, of course, of natural organisms. For example, here is a, here's a tentacle of a sea anemone and uh, as you see here at the bottom there are sensors for touch so if and here, here's a max so if for example this one gets touched then the signal will be active here and that signal will drive a motor which will cause the tentacle to retract like this and this is this is actually this is what it looks like I mean, it's known from uh, neuroscience that, that this, is, this is how it works. Okay, now we have another type which we haven't discussed so far, which is the space nodes. And they are used for remembering uh, activity levels. So, for example, if we taste something here, an apple, it's a sweetness sensor. This apple has a certain level of sweetness. And we want to remember, be able to remember that level of sweetness until the next time. And we do that just by this space node. It will put the, it, it takes the sweetness as input and then remembers it, like this new here. So the next time we taste the apple, we will get output one if, if we have the, the same sweetness. If we have something which is similar but not the same, we may get the output 0 0.9 instead. So this, this sweetness resembles that sweetness to, to uh, up to 90 percent. Okay, so this is for remembering values. That's also something that we know uh, natural nervous system to be able to do. Okay, and uh, then we have, so that's kind of memory, so value memory. Another memory is time memory. Like, first this happens and then some time elapses and then something else happens. So, to um, model this delay, we have a node called delay, also label called delay. So here, if we hear light, a lightning, for example, 
then this is say one second here delay the delay delays the signal and then so one second later it comes here and then at the same time we have thunder so this node recognizes will 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 we'll fire will be active whenever we uh, hear we, we see a lightning and then one second after we hear thunder so this is like the, 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 the piece of knowledge which says that lightning is followed by thunder. It's a temporal sequence. And temporal sequences are useful in a lot of situations. For example, when we have uh, words, phonemes that, that um, uh, form words together, sequences of phonemes, like apple for example, now I just like, write the dot here for the delay node. So this node will recognize the, the, the sequence Apple. And we can do the same, of course, with the symbols, like the, the visual symbols. 3 plus 4 equals 7. This, this, this one will only react when it sees this, exactly this sequence. So, so can we connect this now with repetition and modulation? Absolutely, that's, that's what's going to happen. I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm, I just introduced now the, uh, the, the, the graphic model, what it looks like. And then we're going to start evolving this graphical model. So that, for example, by learning, by repetition and so on. Yeah. To tie back into the earlier part of your talk, where does the imagination come in evolutionarily? Presuming you don't think of bees having imagination, or bees, maybe you do. Well, um, I don't know. What, what do you think about that experiment with the um, with the sugar bowl in the lake? The other ones, were, they, they wouldn't go there because they imagined they couldn't imagine that there were any. Um, I guess that's one way. Yeah. Cashing it out, but you could also explain it in terms that didn't involve imagination and just a failure to yeah. do the appropriate associational yeah. mapping. Yeah, I, I, I can't judge in, in specific situations when imagination imagination is necessary. But I think it's a very so helpful. I, I was curious where in the evolutionary story you see imagination coming in. Where, when does it become? No, but I, I, I think it. I think, I think it comes with neural systems. But, so, so any neural system. That's that, okay. that's that's my guess. In principle. Okay. But of course, um, at, at least when you are able to form memory, that that's uh, that's that's another possibility at least, because there are some very simplistic uh, like reflex agents. They just respond in a completely uh, mechanical way to the environment, and maybe those those don't need. They, those don't have imagination. That's possible. I, I have no idea to summarize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think you're right. So you only need imagination if you have the capacity for flexible behavior. If you're just a stimulus response system, yeah. then. Exactly. What, 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 I mean, what, you, you can't use it for anything yeah, because you're going no. to respond regardless of uh, other things. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so here's okay. You get that. So now we're going to start with we're going to start developing this uh, network. So we have a network which is a very rough mathematical model of natural neural systems. Say. And uh, then we can start with any genotype. This is like the way where the organism is born with a certain wiring, a certain nervous system, and then this system will start evolving in interaction with the environment. So we, we're going to do the same, and we're going to develop a sequence of networks, starting with the genotype, a sequence of networks called the phenotypes. And how do we do that? Yeah, we define rules, for example, repetition maybe one, for adding, deleting, and updating these memory structures. So we are going to add memories, and we're also going to delete some memories that are not used often enough, for example. And we're going to update things, for example, uh, the conditional probabilities. They will reflect our experience, and our experience will change, so we need to update those all the time. 
Okay, so which are our me mechanisms for forming new concepts, new memory structures? Uh, well, one is association, and that's well known from psychology, neuroscience, even philosophy. Aristotle uh, talks about associations. And uh, we do the same. So, if yeah, and then, then we, this is also based on, on Hebbian learning. So we, we use this slogan, if they fire together, they wire together. But if you were a more, uh, let's say, Kantian person, you would perhaps think that the difference between coffee and sugar and lightning and thunder was important. And then you might say that uh, for lightning and thunder we have the inborn category of causality. Why Absolutely. We do not have it for coffee and sugar in that case. So coffee no. doesn't cause sugar. But, but okay, so, so whatever is, is uh, in so you could, you we could, can... Yeah, you could claim that some, on a more specific level than association, some of these things are innate. Yeah. You, you, but you're not claiming that. Yeah, I mean, we, we, I can claim that because I can put all that stuff in the genotype. Yeah, whatever is innate, I put it in the genotype. No, you don't need to, but you could, yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. And... Um, yeah, so, so if they fire together, they wire together. Very basic, extremely powerful principle, which is true, completely verified. So here, for example, if, coffee, if we get coffee and sugar at the same time, then those, they will fire together, right? And then, with our, in our model, they will also wire together. So we take this wire and that wire and put them together with a min gate. It's like an AND, right? And the same thing here, if they fire together with a delay, first lightning and then thunder, then we also wire them together by adding this node. Okay, so that's association. And then we have, um, and, and that's, that's already really powerful because only by, by um, uh, showing things, by, by iterating it, by repetition, this is going to form over and over again. For example, if we, if we get, taste an apple, then we're going to form a memory of the bitterness by merging together all the nodes that wire together, so it'd be like a like a circuit, like a yeah, a boolean and a, bo a boolean circuit, um, and we're gonna get this. This this is going to be a, like a yeah, bitterness memory of the bitterness and the sweetness and the sourness of the apple, and then we're going to join them together because. The sweetness and the sourness of apples will be active at the same time, so this will form and this will form. And then if someone will say apple to us, then this is going to form. This node is this structure is going to form. And if they say it together, if I have apple taste in my mouth, I eat, I'm, eat, I'm eating apple like a child, and then an adult says apple, and then I'm going to associate those two. So this is going to form. They're going to fire together. Uh, yeah. And so this is going to form. They're going to wire together also. So now we, use, we see how imagination is used. Whenever someone says apple, you're going to imagine apple taste. When you, whenever you feel apple taste, you're going to imagine the word apple. So that's kind of a... Yeah, it's, this works as a semantic for, for a part of language. Okay, and in this way we can... A lot of concepts will be formed completely automatically, from, starting from the, the, the sensors. For example, apple taste, as we saw, coffee smell, uh, coffee and sugar together, lightning followed by thunder, a certain si symbol sequence, certain sound sequence. Those things will form automatically, just by exposing the network to them, with some repetition. Because you can't, if it's a complex structure, then you can only form, you only form one uh, min gate at the time. So if it's repeated, if, if, if it's a complex structure, then you need to see it many times. Okay, and then we have... Um, and you're claiming that bees have all of these, except maybe 3 plus 7 is 10, at least not on Yeah, I mean, bees are capable of associative learning, of association. But, I mean, no, I'm not claiming that they know the multiplication table by heart or anything, no. <laughs> but the rest of them bees have... Uh, sorry? The rest of those, your examples, you would attribute to bees? No, not uh, apple, for example. They can't say apple either. Or understand. Oh, was that, was that a part of it, to have a linguistic label? 
one, man. Yeah, I don't know. But the, 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 beer, the beast here, do you think? Do they have acoustics? No. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Um, um, but this one, for example, they can associate sugar with something else. They're good at that. Okay, and now we also have a mechanism for forgetting. I'll get back to that one. But, uh, throwing out structures, because otherwise we would just build a huge uh, structure. Whenever something new appears, we're going to build a structure, and uh, then that, that will uh, exhaust uh, any memory. Especially if you only have 950,000 neurons. Okay, and then, so association, dissociation, that's that one, and then we have one called abstraction. And this is the basis of abstraction, it's called anti unification. Just a little short course on what that is. If we have two terms here, function fx5 and f3y, for example, then we unify them. It means that we take um, an instance, uh, yeah, an instance, a substitution instance, which, oh, which is a substitution instance of both of this and that. And so this is like a specialization. And this, going the opposite direction, generalization, then it's called anti-unification instead. So then we take, we're looking for something more general, of which this and that is our special cases. So then we get f, x, y up there. So going down here is called unification, and going up is called anti-unification. And don't bother, don't worry if you didn't get that. Here are some examples. So A and B, we anti-unify, we get X. F, A, C, and F, B, C, you see that the C is, is in common here. So then we get F and then a variable X and C. Okay, and this is how, how we use it, for example. Suppose that we see um, 2 times 0 is 0. Okay, we learn that sequence, where we saw, and we also see, we also learn 3 times 0 is 0. Then we can find, as humans, we can find a pattern there, right? We can suspect that there is a pattern. We can suspect that, okay, it doesn't matter what I plug in here in the beginning, if it's time zero, it's still going to be zero. So this is what what this mechanism will do. So remember, this is this is uh, short for a structure. This is a structure. This is a structure. And then from that one, we will form a third structure, which is an abstraction of both. Okay, what's the point of that? We, we form another one. Yeah, the point is that in the future we're not going to need to form, for example, seven times zero is zero, because we can derive that from what we already know. So that's economy, information economy. You're just uh, talking about inductive reasoning. Right? Inductive reasoning, absolutely. Yeah. And that's something that we are, uh, I mean, it's a very fu fundamental uh, type of reasoning which many animals can do. Okay, but when you made it, when you made the abstraction, then it becomes deductive. Then it becomes so deductive for the next case. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So you okay? So that's part of your program is to unify deduction and induction. Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, how, how they are uh, interconnected? Absolutely. Well, interconnecting is one thing. Unifying. Oh, okay. Connecting. Yeah. Connecting. Yeah. Connect. Oh, okay. yeah so not, okay. Let's say yeah. uh, less ambitious level. <laughs> exactly. I I, I want to stay there. Okay, so we use variables. We introduce variables now. What are the variables here? Well, they are just uh, some, they are still nodes, but they are the special nodes, so we can imagine that we can bind them to arbitrary nodes. For example, in working memory. If someone asks us, what is 23 times 0? I say, uh huh. I know that anything times 0 is 0. So, in particular, 23 times 0 is 0. I bind it there. Okay, and here's another example of abstraction. This is like when the child learns the meaning of the word uh, child, for example, let's say, or, or, or parents. They don't know what parent is. So then they, they see two examples connecting child to parents. So the word child, uh, the word parent is defined in terms of child. We know what, child, what a child is. Then how can we know what a parent is? Yeah, it's the same thing. 
you just in this case you just swap around the arguments. So we have two examples here of uh, of uh, two concrete examples, and then we say, okay, I think it's going to be. I think this is a general principle. I can use abstraction to form this new structure, which kind of captures the abstract pattern. And another example here: if we have if we're having cake when it's windy, and if we're having uh, uh, yeah. And if we're having snow, if we're having cake when it's snowing, we, yeah, we can we can abstract from that and deduce take what is in common with abstraction. That would be cake in this case. <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm, going get, I'm going to get to get back to this example actually. I, I'm not sure what all the conditions are. We have cake. <laughs> yes. yeah. Okay, so now we come to the, the core of the matter when we are going to introduce reward for concept development, memory formation. See. And reward, how can that be introduced into a system? Well, we can do as they do in, in uh, reinforcement learning. We have a real value sensor for reward and punishment. And in more realistic applications, this could be a weighted sum of uh, our needs, like uh, Hunger, thirst, sleepiness, etc. Like, how good are we feeling? What's that? What's a uh, yeah? In, 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 how, how how is it going? Kind of, yeah, that's the, the answer. Is the reward level? Okay, so we have a reward which is given all the time as a sensor, as an input from the environment to the to the um, uh, agent, and part of that may actually be generated from the agent itself. Um, but if, and if we have a reward signal, we can calculate all the time the, the average rewar reward of a, of a node. So we can take any node and we can say, okay, whenever this node is active, what level of reward is it? What, what level of reward do we have at that particular point in time? Uh, and that's how we calculate the, the average reward. For example, let's say here are some examples, completely made up, of course. The cake, uh, okay, let's say that's 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 reward. It's three. Let's say the average reward is three. So whenever whenever cake is active, for example, when it's cake when it's windy and I'm having cake, cake is active, and then the reward is three. And uh, when it's uh, snowing, it's uh, three point five. And so on. But the, the average is three, and we have some other examples with <coughs> for punishment representing punishment minus four. When you eat Very bad. Sorry. When you eat the cake. Sorry. When you eat the cake, hit with the cake. <laughs> eat the cake. <laughs> eat the cake. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. But when you eat the cake and when you see the cake. They will be very related to you because it's like only, yeah. The, the the rewarding situation is when you eat the cake, but when you see the cake, you are close to the re, to the reward. So the reward 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 will spread to that situation. So it's almost as good to see a cake as it is to eat the cake. Oh. Grass? <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, maybe that wasn't a general truth. <laughs> Okay, let's say grass, I don't know, we have grass, we have seen grass in a lot of situations, both positive and negative, so let's say that they're really a bit neutral. It's, it's neither... Apple, it's pretty good. Uh, 0.5, I think it's slightly positive. And hunger and apple, if we're, if we're hungry at the same time as we see the apple, if, if that concept is active, active okay, then that's, that's better. Then, then I see kind of a solution to my problem, a way of getting higher reward. Okay, and then I have this concept of top active nodes. So a node is top active if uh, it is active to begin with. I mean, and I'm talking about perceptual activity. And it has no other active node above it. So no, it's not part of a more complex uh, concept, which is active. Okay, and then I use the notion of learning speed. And that's also from uh, uh, reinforcement learning. Inspired, inspired from reinforcement learning. And um, we can say that it's, it determines, in this case, it's, it acts on the association rule. So it, it 
it uh, uh, determines the speed at which uh, new pairs, new associations are formed. And the learning speed, we give it, we, we use this formula now, uh, beta, which is just the real number, it's like the base speed, if, if nothing happens, if there's no emotion, then we still learn because of repetition. So this is, um, yeah, our minimum learning speed, so to speak. But then we have something here, which is uh, sigma for surprise. And the surprise, in this case, means that we take the reward that we have right now, and then we take the average reward of a node that is active, that is top active. So many nodes are active. Wing is active, cake is active, and so on. But, and then, then, and then and the cake, uh, let's say the cake is uh, three, average reward three. And now I'm, I'm having this cake in this situation, and I'm experiencing reward level three. So then the explanation here for me would be that, okay, I'm experiencing reward level three because I'm having cake is active and cake has reward level three. So it must be cake that uh, causes this. So in that case, there's no surprise. It is as expected. Uh, yeah. So, so I can say that th this term, the learning speed is given by a baseline plus uh, an amount of deviation between the, the, the expected reward and the actual reward we got. And you can see that there is also, this is, it's an absolute uh, uh, operator here. So it means that but if the reward is bigger or smaller than expected, then we're going to learn it more. So if, it, if we get more punish, punished than we expected, we're going to learn it. If we get more reward than we expected, we're also going to learn it faster. Okay. And then, yeah. So now I've introduced um, the three, there are only three, um, yeah, three main mechanisms at least for concept development. Association, dissociation, and uh, abstraction. Yeah, and then they are triggered under various conditions, these rules. So, and the association is basically when it, it, it's given by, by the learning speed, right? Association. And um, so here, for example, we have, uh, yeah, this is a situation where we have, we're having cake and icing. And they are both top active, those nodes. The average reward of cake is three. And the icing is also three. That's our average. But now we're having both of them together because they are both active. And the, the current reward is five all of a sudden. Oops, a surprise. There is no uh, other node ex uh, explaining that high level. So it means that learning is going to take place. So we're going to learn that cake and icing is something good. So we're going to form that concept. Cake and icing, and I'm going to assign five to it. Where this five came from? Uh, the five count is, is the current reward signal. Uh, the agent gets a reward all the time. So from the environment. It's like uh, how, uh, how that's happen in practice. Is it uh, so there is some reward uh, values on the some of the states of the environment which are just put there? Or? I mean, there, there, there is, there is uh, a reward signal coming from the environment all the time, just like in reinforcement learning. And there are also numbers that we use for storing the average reward that each node has received when it has been active. But you're, you're, you're allowing that the current reward can effectively be arbitrary, right? It can be arbitrary, absolutely. And then we're going to react to it. If it, if it is off bounds, then we're going to learn very much. Okay, here's something really new is, is, is going on, and we have to learn this, because this is associated with an extreme reward or extreme punishment or something. Okay, and uh, so, so in this way, we were kind of uh, positively surprised, right? We got uh, more... The sums... Well, the reward of the sum was more than the, than the reward of the terms. And here is the opposite effect. We like cake, it's, it's three, but if ketchup, for example, it's, it's two. That's it. But if we mix them, we're now going to have both. They're both active here. And the current go, oh my god, this doesn't taste good. Minus two. Then, okay, it's a negative surprise. So we're going to form this concept too. Concept uh, ketchup and cake. And assign minus two, the current reward. 
Okay, and then we have um, the situation where nothing happens. We're having cake, uh, and we're uh, and then some other nodes are active. It doesn't, doesn't matter what, what, what uh, average rewards they have. And the current reward is 3. Then we have this explanation. So, the current reward equals the expected reward in this node. So this means that um, there is no surprise. And uh, the learning speed will be down at the base level. So that, that's assimilation. We use Piaget's terminology. It's assimilation. You're not going to reshape your nervous system. As you do when you accommodate. Okay, and then this situation. <coughs> when do we forget things? What things do we forget? Well, I, this is a su suggestion. So, a node which has, for example, high frequency, <coughs> often active, it has been there for a long time, and it, um, it is active when you have a lot of um, uh, reward, for example. That's a perfect node for remembering. But, if the node is used rarely, it, uh, you, it was created fairly recently, <coughs> and it's just uh, fairly neutral, it doesn't represent any, any emotional value, then it will be forgotten in this model. Now what do we do? Well, we call this also de-pairing, dissociation. We have a pair, right? That's, that's uh, the association forms a pair. And then we're just going to remove this thing again, so that it falls back. This was used, this, we, we, this was very useful. <coughs> So I want to I want to throw this away. This particular gate will be thrown away. Okay, because we can we can form of course a lot of concepts just by exposing ourselves to something uh, all the time. We're going to form a complete picture of what of what we see. We're going to remember everything if we see it long enough. But so anything can be formed. But then if we leave, go out to another situation, we to gradually forget it, unless it was very emotionally charged, for example, and if it's not repeated, we're going to forget it eventually. Okay, and then we come to abstraction. It's, uh, it's interesting to talk about the, the triggering conditions for abstraction. So, here we have the same example again, but now I also include the rewards. So, um, this is something which can be discovered by kind of introspection. It's not, it's not triggered by environment. Instead, it's something that uh, an, an operation for updating the, the, the nerve system, which is done on the basis of introspection. For example, I'm not, when we sleep, for example, maybe this happens. Is this an innate capacity? Yeah, I mean, all the th those three mechanisms, association, dissociation, and abstraction, they are kind of big... Uh, Big principle, um, super principles, or something like that, and yeah, they are, they are. Uh, it's, it's like a law that, that, well, that all these this, systems follow. This is actually the classical empiricist agenda. Ah, uh, sure, absolutely. And um, I mean, uh, yeah, but agenda. I mean, my, my agenda is to build uh, artificial systems that work. But but uh, but, but I'm, I mean, from, from a philosophical standpoint, I'm sure it's done. In, Nothing new. And no, it's like the <coughs> Yes, I mean, sure. I, I don't mind that at all. Um, okay, so we have this, this one, and we get reward one because it's true, and this one also reward one. And re the reward in this case doesn't derive from it. It, uh, it derives from the fact that it, that it has been a part of rewarding computations. You came to the correct conclusion. You thought in the correct way, and that gave you a reward because it made you find the cake, for example. And the rules that you used when you came to that conclusion will be rewarded. So, if we have this situation, we are going to form this instead and also see it as something positive. Yeah, okay, and then, like I said, I want to kind of generalize reinforcement learning so that it uh, comprises also concept formation. Um, but I will, now we have to explain how we can get reinforcement learning on actions back into this uh, in, in, or, or into this model. 
And um, yeah, we can associate actions to nodes. So in general, many, many nodes will be active, many nodes will be top active even. And we don't form a, 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 like a big state of everything. That would be that would be good from the perspective of reinforcement learning, but it's hard because it would be we would have to form too many nodes simply. So we can't do that. We have a lot of active nodes, and then um, we are going to associate with each node. We're going to associate an action, and the action that will fire will be the one which predicts the current situation best. So we're going to take the top active node whose average reward is close to the current reward and whose, as, as a tiebreaker if we need that, we're going to take those that are, that are common. So common explanations are better than uncommon ones. And to be an explanation you have to, uh, you have, to have um, a correct idea of, um, make a correct prediction about reward. So it's all reward driven. Okay, and now uh, social, social signals. That's that's why I'm here. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so I thought one slide would be good. Yeah. So I think it, okay. In this, in one sense, uh, I, I don't. Yeah. It, it, it's not. Uh, I don't have much to say about that. But I think I thought that the whole conclusion is very spectacular. If we take, um, if we take. Um, uh, organisms that are social, then they give each other feedback all the time, right? And that feedback will affect their behavior. That's nothing new. But if you think about it uh, deeply, it means that other people change the way my brain looks. And in this case, this is what happens literally. It, it, it's, it's not just that, okay, I adapt to that. But no, it's that you shape my brain. And that's that's pretty strong. I mean, at least I think so. Um, and, and this is what happens, like I said, also in this model. Because we can let part of the reward signal come from the social environment. For example, we can imagine that we have an agent which is built on this principle. And the agent um, will like, be my assistant, let's say. And I can give reward or punishment to that agent just by saying good, bad, bad, very good, for example, very bad. So it means that the agent will learn things. When, when I say very bad, it's going to learn fast that it's bad and what it looks like when it's bad. Um, and when I say that it's good, I'm going to encourage the behavior. So this will be just like we raise a child or a dog. Maybe. Um, and I think it's, it enables a very um, nice kind of interface because it's not that we have to show the robot what it should do. I mean, that that's good to have too. But in this case, it's enough to just encourage it, say, yeah, well done, or that's very bad. Never do that again. And we can also stay completely passive. We don't have to do anything. The robot will function anyway, learn, but it will learn less efficiently. And we can also do something in between. We can uh, encourage it to uh, focus on certain things. So don't stare in, into that wall all the time when you're idle. Walk around and familiarize yourself with the, the environment here. So I think that. Um, this model is, um, yeah, it's, yeah, could be interesting from also from a, from an application viewpoint um, down the line. Right. So some kind of conclusion: we define a model for memory development based on reward. Memory development is both. Concept creation, concept destruction, concept modification. Now we use three basic principles that are very, I don't know, strong and profound somehow, I think at least. Association, dissociation, and abstraction. And then we can easily integrate this with social signals. And we can use it uh, to build simple interfaces for human interaction.
not a question, but uh, a comment or observation. Of course, people use terms like concepts in many different ways. And I don't have the last That's why I, I avoided it until the end. That's a correct yeah. way to, to use it. I think there are multiple ways that, that are very useful. I just find it very interesting that um, concepts as for example, Petri Erdenforsch, or I talk about them, sit between associations and symbols. So they're more than associations, or they're, there's something cognitively more complex than associations, but there's something less than symbols. So on Petri's account, um, association, that which is strictly association-based is to uh, inflexible, it's not spontaneous in the Kantian sense, um, which, which Petra or I would require for what we talk about as concepts. On the other hand, symbols are too impoverished, they're too rarefied. Um, you need a whole bunch of context behind symbols in order for symbols to be useful. And so concepts of these things that sit in the middle. Um, and here, at least, uh, and I think elsewhere when we've talked, um, what you're talking about as concepts are, are much more toward the association-based end of things. Yeah, I, I think that um, it is possible to combine those things, oh, yeah. grosso yeah. modo. Yeah. For example... It's not uh, incompatible. No, uh, because what I... I mean, I, I use now, when I say concept, I mean memory structure. And I also mean, in the model, I mean a graph structure, like a subgraph. And the subgraph that would be associated with a certain node is the, its set of uh, imagination nodes, uh, imagination edges leading away from it. So it's like the, its set of connotations, you can say. The concept itself and its set of connotations. I mean, that would be one way of, uh, of making it more precise. I don't know if it would land exactly where you and uh, the other for, uh, but one of the consequences is that you're going to be talking about concepts in simpler organisms than uh, yeah, right. yeah. or I would. Yeah, okay, sure. So, so when, when would you say, what kind of animals have concepts, would you say? I think clearly higher primates, certain bird species, uh, probably dolphins, and then when you get beyond that it gets much more, much murkier. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, concepts on, on that sort of account are marked by an ability to derive uh, new uh, novel categories from specific instances of experiences to then apply those new categories back to uh, novel experiences and to demonstrate surprise when your, if you will, conceptual expectations are violated. But in your and that sort of cognitive flexibility is characteristic of a certain group of animals, much more than we used to think a few years ago, but much less than all of the animal kingdom. But on your view, it's, it's not right to say that memory structure and uh, concepts are the same thing. Uh, well, rather, what I talk about as concepts is dependent on memory structures, but requires uh, a flexibility that memory structures of themselves don't necessarily. But if you add this neuroplasticity to, no, to uh, memory structures, they still don't. Well, you, you have to have some uh, sense of spontaneity in the Kantian sense, some sense that the, the organism uh, could choose otherwise. Okay, yes. Let's, uh, other questions? No? Yep. I just uh, make an uh, association of uh, uh, this lecture and some of the talks about uh, intelligent and autonomous uh, uh, virtual agents sometimes. I thought that it's maybe good application not only a robotic system, uh, this kind of uh, reward reinforcement system to use to train, for example, your autonomous avatar. Because like, I, I see somehow easier to make rewards in a virtual environment than uh, Sure. And then uh, you don't need to program some rules, just reinforce uh, your idea. Yeah, but we should develop this in a, in a virtual environment, you mean? 
I have a general question about um, um, essentially in your system the reward, I mean from a reinforcement learning perspective, the reward is generated very easily. But from uh, reinforcement learning, the machine learning perspective, um, I think re reinforcement learning always faces this kind of bottleneck to find this uh, general evaluation of the reward or reinforced signals. Like, um, it seems reward to me, uh, it covers different levels. I mean, from a low level, we do something, we get a reward. But the, on a high level, cognitive level especially, we, we associate a little bit two concepts together and you can get a reward. Or if you can predict in the future, you can get different kinds of rewards. So my question is how do you evaluate this reward um, in, in a general way in our system? I, 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 don't, uh, I don't bother about that part, but I don't bother about how the reward is generated. Uh, but I, I think that one way of doing it, for example, in a virtual world would be to have, uh, let's say that the only need is hunger, for example. And then there's a certain food supply distributed in, uh, in, spa in, in space, 2D space maybe. Uh, and in that way, you will have like a natural situation, like an animal looking for food, walking around, uh, burning energy, and then, <coughs> and then uh, the, 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 the reward would go down, and then uh, it will go, go to certain places to forage, it will learn where to find food, and so on. And there will also be this explore, exploit uh, dilemma that it will have to solve. But isn't that, um, I mean, what, you would like to see something more than that or other than that? Yeah, I, I have this feeling that um, revolt, I mean, is too abstract, actually. I mean, Greek. <laughs> yeah, it's too abstract. And I actually, after doing some of the research for reinforcement learning, I, I started to get confused. What is reward, actually? Mm -hmm. It's emotional system based, or sometimes it's also perceptual system based on I me. Mean, it comes from too many directions and cannot find this converged thread. To yeah, but if you, if you take uh, the, uh, the, the most successful perhaps applications of reinforcement learning with um, uh, robots, robot locomotion, snake robots, um, um, etc. Mm -hmm. um, then you have a very clear notion of uh, reward and success which you can which you can feed back to the to the animal. Locomotion, how many centimeters do you move? Did, did, did you move in, in the past uh, five seconds? <coughs> That's your reward. It's very clear and totally uh, unproblematic. But of course, if you want uh, more complex behavior, you have to take uh, other things into account. Yeah. yeah, I would like to make a comment also. So, in distinction to Joe, I think what you have now is good because you don't need these concepts. I mean, you have memory structures, you have mechanisms that are enough. And also, in contradistinction to Joel, I think symbols but, are but not. The first one wasn't in. I mean, no, I just okay, want to make some. I mean, we don't all have the same view, right? As you know. So in this case, I'm actually going to be agreeing with you. We could make this a little simpler. We could have memory structures, etc., information, and that could be structure. And we don't need to introduce the notion of concept. And we can no, have no, sure, a picture notion of icon and symbol, no, but which can do the same job. And then we don't need the unnecessary duplication of concepts and linguistic means. But we've had no. this debate before. So yeah, and I mean, let's it's not do it once more. Exactly. So because, because I mean, I can uh, for all those who think that. The word concept is problematic, and I think I'm among those. No, you I would not, really should be. After having heard these debates, you should start to think it's problematic. No, no but, but <laughs> of course, but, but, but I'm using it in a, I'm using it in a very well-defined sense, and uh, I mean, I, 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 I use it as memory structure only myself. Well, you should not continue to think that that's unproblematic. That no, but I, I, no, but of course I don't think it's. I think it's highly problematic. That's yeah, why I yeah. use memory structure instead. Right. Good. Good. Yeah. I, I agree. But I think in order to convince us, Klaus, 
you really have to make this a little more social. So we would like... I mean, what you presented us with is it actually a, a basic empiricist account of learning. Uh, sure. Robinson Crusoe on his island without anybody around, this, this would apply fine. He doesn't need any, you know, he could be reinforced by That's the right. environment, That's right. except he doesn't need any other human beings yep. at all. So why not, for your next exercise, I mean, the attraction of your framework is that it is simple, and that's your logical background. You sort of see everything you're doing, that's good. I like that. But why not take on a social learning task? For example, how close we stand to each other in conversation, or, you know, some, some simple social... I mean, there are, during this week we've had lots of examples of simple social uh, behavior. Yeah, but that's why I went to bees instead. I don't want to... <coughs> I don't want it to be too complex. It's co too complicated. No, no, but I'm yeah. saying we, there are plenty of simple. I mean, you're talking about tasting apples and so on. That's yeah. fair, fair exactly. complex too. And we have you know, equally simple things. I think aspirin gives me the whole. We could we could pick some some simple social behaviors and try to model your way. Hmm. Then then everybody here would think, ah, maybe we could do it this simple way. <laughs> yeah, that that's a. Yeah, that's, that's more my general comment, that it would be more convincing if we have some more social, uh, to see that it works that for, for those behaviors as well. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I, I mean, I, my, my general feeling is that it's good. I mean, when, when, sometimes when we see these co computational models, we have no idea what's going on inside. I mean, neural networks, who knows what's going on. <laughs> yeah. But here we can actually see this step by step what's going on. <laughs> Which but, at least I think I find attractive. But uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how, I'm, I'm not sure um, to what extent others have been working on things like uh, memory formation based on the notion of reward and punishment. But uh, it, it is at least implicit in the uh, uh, psychologist's work on operant conditioning and so on. Because you, I mean, you learn more if you get punished or if you get rewarded. That's kind of the uh, uh, bottom line. In psychology, there's been a criticism of that approach too. Mm -hmm. Along the lines that uh, Gauss here pointed to, that you, know, you get so many different kinds of that, rewards. That, that okay, the reward, reward, gets meaningless. reward and punishment is a bit um, one-dimensional, of course. Yeah, But I think that um, living organisms have a certain amount of needs, a very limited amount of needs. And um, those, and, and I think that evolution has actually produced um, um, emotions in us simply to be able to um, to uh, uh, estimate the value of different resources and of uh, judging between choosing between different actions and so on. It's, it's, it's a guiding. It's a very powerful guiding principle which enables us to, to um, develop behavior which will guarantee our survival somehow. That's, that's how I see it. So I, th I think that evolutions have been, no, I think that emotions have been evolved in an evolutionary process and it's uh, extremely um, a, a very powerful mechanism. And I also think that um, all animals who are capable of learning have this notion of, um, uh, yeah, have, have emotions, I would say, actually, even though I know that that's entering uh, Dangerous ground. Okay, thank you very much, Claude.